Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Glad it's finally here. Uh, I do not have any uh, announcements to begin, uh, so we can go straight to your questions. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to start with the administration's letter on um, transgender bathrooms. Okay. Guys in schools. I thought you might. Um, I thought I'd give you a chance to respond to Texas uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who yeah. said that the letter, uh, called the letter blackmail, and said um, that the administration is doing everything it can to, uh, or he said this is about dividing, uh, it's going to divide the country, and it has everything to do with keeping the federal government out of local issues. Yeah. Well, I think this does underscore the risk of uh, electing a right-wing radio host to a statewide elected office. Um, so let's just uh, walk through the facts here. The first is this is guidance that was issued by the Department of Education and the Department of Justice. In response to requests for information and guidance from school administrators across the country. Just last week, for example, the National Association of Secondary School Principals put forward a specific formal request to the Department of Education about how to create the kind of respectful, inclusive environment that school administrators across the country are seeking to maintain. Uh, these principals also are interested in making sure that they're acting consistent with the law. And they sought guidance because they're not interested in a political argument. They're actually interested in practical suggestions about how they confront this challenge that they face every day. So let's just be clear about what's included in the guidance. The guidance does not add additional requirements to the applicable law. The guidance does not require any student to use shared facilities when schools make alternate arrangements. But what the framework does provide is advice for how school administrators can protect the dignity and safety of every student under their charge. And that advice includes practical, tangible, real-world suggestions to school administrators who have to deal with this issue. They can't rely on political arguments that are framed as a solution to a problem that nobody can prove exists they actually have to deal with the responsibility that they have to promote an inclusive, respectful environment for all of their students. And what the Department of Education has issued today is specific, tangible, real-world advice and suggestions to school administrators across the country about how exactly they can do that. I but you wouldn't argue, or it, it seems as though the administration is also trying to paint this as a major civil rights issue, right? And this isn't just a pragmatic sort of everyday guidance to schools. You're uh, you know, uh, Attorney General Lynch has compared this to racial segregation. Well, I think Attorney General Lynch was talking about a very specific enforcement action that the Department of Education announced, or the Department of Justice uh, announced with regard to a specific law that was passed by the state of North Carolina. Uh, in this instance, this is not an enforcement action. Uh, as I pointed out, this does not add any additional requirements to any school district or state under the applicable law. This is in response to extensive requests for guidance and for information in it and uh, advice that have been fo put forward by school administrators and teachers and uh, in some cases even parents who are seeking practical solutions to this challenge. And the challenge here is not to isolate anybody. It's not to discriminate against anybody. It's not to make anybody unsafe. It's actually to ensure that our schools are as inclusive and respectful and safe as they can possibly be. Uh, and that's why the guidance that we've put forward includes tangible, specific suggestions for how that can be achieved. So let me just give you one example. There, there are some school districts across the country that have sought to enhance the privacy of their students by making relatively minor changes to shared use facilities. In some cases, that means just putting up curtains so that people are, uh, have more privacy when they're changing their clothes or taking 
uh, showers in what w had previously been shared use facilities. So that is something that benefits all students. And that's what we're looking for, solutions that protect the safety and dignity of every single student in the school. And, and so schools individually decide not to follow this guidance. There, there is a, a threat that they could lose their funding. Well, if, if there are schools, first of all, let me just state that it is my strongly held belief, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be right about this, that the vast majority of schools and school districts and school administrators across the country will welcome this guidance and will implement it. For those that don't, there's an established process for them to raise any concerns that they may have. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's an, an established process for that, and, you know, we'll go through it. But the vast majority of schools and school administrators will incorporate this advice as they confront the challenge of ensuring that they're promoting the kind of respectful, safe learning environment that can ensure the success of all of their students. Okay, I'm going to just switch topics okay. uh, briefly. The, um, uh, Chairman Rogers is uh, saying he's put together a, a Zika measure, and he didn't put a dollar figure amount, but it's safe to say it's going to be well under what you all have asked, even under the Senate, of $1.1 trillion. So mm -hmm. um, are you willing to accept $1.1 trillion? Uh, and is that enough money to, to fight Zika? Well, uh, I guess I haven't seen the details related to Chairman Rogers' proposal. Um, I think what I would encourage him to do before he puts it forward, I don't know if he has yet, but if he hasn't, if there's still time, he should consult with the public health professionals that the administration talked to in, put forwarding, in putting forward our funding request for what is necessary to do everything possible to protect the American people from the Zika virus. Uh, time's a wasting. Uh, and you saw that from the, the graphic that we presented in the briefing earlier this week. As the weather warms up, as the mosquito population grows, the risk to pregnant women and their babies all across the country grows. Uh, and so it's long past time for people like Chairman Rogers, who's got a substantial responsibility here. He's the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. When our public health professionals say that they need resources to protect the American people, they're looking exactly at, at Chairman Rogers to see exactly what he's doing. And here we are three months after the administration has put forward our proposal, that he comes forward with a, a much smaller one that is inconsistent with the recommendations of our public health professionals. It's also inconsistent of the request that was put forward by Democratic and Republican governors from across the country who said that they needed urgent congressional action to provide the necessary resources to keep the American people safe. So uh, before, um, before that proposal is put forward. I would encourage uh, the chairman to consult with uh, governors who are responsible for the safety of the citizens of their state and the public health professionals who've taken a look at this and understand exactly what can be done and what should be done to ensure the safety and security of the American people and particularly uh, pregnant women and their babies. Okay. Roberta. Um, Hezbollah's top military commander has been killed and I'm wondering um, does the administration have a have a um, understanding of of who was responsible for that, and any comment on what impact this may have on um, on the group? Well, uh, I've certainly seen reports that uh, Mustafa Buradin was killed this week in Syria, uh, and uh, we noted the fact that preparations are underway for his funeral. Uh, Buradin was uh, Hezbollah's top military commander in June of 2011. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon charged him with the 2005 attack that killed uh, form, former Prime Minister Hariri. Uh, in September of 2012, the United States imposed sanctions against Hezbollah leaders, including uh, Badur Adin, uh, in part to expose Hezbollah's support for the Assad regime and its role in conducting indiscriminate terrorist attacks in Syria and Lebanon. We've noted that the Syrian regime and Hezbollah have a long military alliance. And Hezbollah leaders have previously sought safe haven in Syria uh, and have even routed weapons from uh, Iran into Lebanon. So the interplay between the Assad regime and Hezbollah is, has been well chronicled. So we've seen the reports of his death. I can't independently confirm them. And 
the, uh, I guess the thing that I can confirm is that um, there were no U.S. or coalition uh, aircraft uh, in the area where he was reported to be killed. Um, but, I, uh, but I can't further uh, uh, confirm the report. And can you just speak to what impact this will have, the U.S. feels this will have on, on the group and its activities? Well, we know that the, that, that the Assad regime relied heavily on Hezbollah for military support in the ongoing um, chaos inside of Syria. Uh, and, and the Assad regime and President Assad himself has personally benefited from uh, the activities that Hezbollah has, has carried out. Um, so I, it, it's hard for me to, to draw any firm conclusions about what uh, operational impact this would have. Uh, but, um, but obviously the, this, the concerns that we've previously expressed, expressed about Hezbollah uh, I think are um, uh, consistent with um, our ongoing efforts to reduce uh, the violence inside of Syria uh, and get all of the parties, including the Assad regime, to abide by the ceasefire. Uh, those, are our, those are our priorities because we want to try and bring out a political solution uh, to the chaos inside of Syria. Uh, on the school bathroom issue, um, how concerned is the administration about legal challenges? Um, the Texas Attorney General is saying that this oversteps the administration's constitutional authority. Um, and can you speak to, I mean, you said very clearly, Kathleen, that the vast, you expect the vast majority of schools will implement the guidance. But for those that don't, what, what happens with them? Is the administration actively going to follow up with them? and? and punish them in some way? Well, there's, a, there's an established process for schools and the Department of Education to uh, discuss uh, guidance that they've been provided. I just want to reiterate, and this is important for people who are interested in the legal aspect of this, there's no additional requirement that is that under the applicable law that's being imposed on schools. There's just not. Despite the claims of uh, political uh, opponents of the administration, there is a strong desire on the part of some politicians to, to try and score some cheap political points by presenting a solution to a problem that they can't prove exists. And what the administration has tried to do is to pr provide, at the request of school administrators, practical real-world advice that they can use in their school communities to address this challenge. Those are the, those, that's, that's the practical offering that we have put forward here. That's a lot different than what, uh, than the argument that, that others are making. For example, is the, is, it, is the Texas Attorney General suggesting somehow that it would be practical to station a law enforcement officer outside of every public bathroom in an educational facility and check people's birth certificates on the way in? That doesn't sound like a practical application to me. It also doesn't sound like small government to me. It certainly sounds like a government intrusion to me. But again, that's what's hard to sift through in all of this. What exactly is the practical argument or suggestion that they're making? I recognize that they've got some sharp political arguments that were honed of over uh, years of uh, morning drive time radio in Houston. But school administrators don't have the benefit of just talking. They actually have a functional responsibility to protect the safety and dignity of every student at their school. And the vast majority of school administrators take that responsibility quite seriously. And I think we'll welcome and implement the guidance that's been issued by the Department of Education today. Okay, we'll move around. Gregory. A lot of times when um, a, a guidance or regulation or directive comes from a federal agency, it's portrayed as a White House action. Could you address uh, with this uh, transgender bathroom issue? Did this come from the White House? Was the White House consulted? How unitary is the is the unitary executive on on things like this? Is, I guess what I'm asking is, is is the White House and the Obama administration synonymous for all intents and purposes with something like this? Well, putting forward uh, guidance like this is the responsibility of the Department of Education, uh, and they have to consider a broad range of policy implications. For, uh, for schools all across the country. So this is the responsibility of the Department of Education. 
but you would expect the White House to be responsible for coordinating policy decisions that are made by agencies. So of course the White House was uh, aware of the policy deliberations that have been underway at the Department of Education for quite some time. But ultimately, this is the responsibility and the function of the Department of Education, and they are the ones who receive requests from schools all across the country, and they are the ones who are putting forward uh, guidance for uh, how schools can deal with this particular situation. Okay. Ron. A lot of this is based on Title IX. What is the rationale the, the, that the administration has come to to base this guidance on Title IX, just to be clear about that? Well, I... Um, I'm happy to be overruled by an attorney at the Department of Justice or the Department of Education that you can consult after this hearing, but, or after this briefing, but let me, me. let me try. <laughs> um, my understanding is that Title IX applies specifically to preventing sex discrimination in educational institutions. And the idea that individuals are discriminated against because of their gender identity is the basis for uh, the guidance that we're putting forward. Nobody should be discriminated against because of who they are. And our suggestion is that the rules should apply to everybody equally. And that's the basis of this guidance, that every student should have access to facilities that every other student has access to. No one should be discriminated against because of who they are. And that's the, that's the, the basis uh, for this guidance. That's also why we say no student is forced to use shared facilities. And if there are alternate facilities available that are made available by administrators, then every student should have access to those as well. But why shouldn't local communities be making these very intimate decisions? Mm -hmm. it, it, what, what, why should the federal, how does the federal government know what's best in so many different communities where there are different um, cultural sensitivities to very different, why is this not a local matter? It is a local matter. That is exactly the so position of the Obama the administration. Uh, the federal government is providing specific suggestions based on examples that we've collected from across the country. And the guidance is presented. It is not an additional requirement under the applicable law. It doesn't uh, uh, provide any obligation to a student, for example, to use a shared facility. Rather, what it does is we have consulted with schools all across the country and surfaced good suggestions, good examples, in some cases even best practices for uh, addressing this situation. That's, that's the essence of guidance. That's at the essence of the coordinating role that the Department of Education plays. At the same time, Ron, there's a long history in our country of the federal government playing a very important role in ensuring that people aren't discriminated against. Regarding the, the health care law and the new rule, what, what's different? What exactly is the, so this how, is how does this apply to the transgender community specifically now? What's different? So this is a good example of, of what I was just talking about. Uh, there's a new rule uh, that uh, is um, part of the uh, Affordable Care Act or the implementation of the Affordable Care Act that prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, gender identity, age, or disability, and it ensures that individuals with limited English proficiency can access language assistance when they're seeking health care. Uh, again, a basic responsibility of the federal government, and this has been true throughout our nation's history, as ensuring that uh, the people aren't discriminated against, and that's particularly true when it comes to health care as well, and that's uh, that's true of, uh, uh, of any potential sex discrimination, but that also uh, is relevant to discrimination that could be targeted for people, targeted at people because of their race, because of uh, a perceived disability, because somebody's pregnant, because somebody doesn't speak English very well. We believe people should be treated the same and afforded the same kind of opportunities regardless of uh, these specific individual characteristics. Well, isn't, this, isn't the mention of transgender patients or uh, isn't that specific, isn't that new, isn't that different? Uh, I, I, all of what I've laid out is a new part of the, the rule that's been issued today. What was the harm in terms of the transgender community? Was there some identifiable problem out there that, um, that, that required this clarification or this augmentation to the, to the rule? Well, again, uh, Ron, this is much broader than just 
um, applying to the transgender community. But the transgender community is included. In the same way that we want to prevent discrimination uh, against pregnant women, we want to make sure that we're preventing discrimination against transgender women. In the same way that we're preventing discrimination against people who don't speak English very well uh, or, or, or people who uh, have a specific disability, you know, we want to make sure that uh, transgendered men are not discriminated against either. Specifically because there's some concern in that community about uh, access to transition drugs and medications and services. Is, was that something that the administration was concerned about in terms of trying to, uh, I guess you could say, refine this, this, this rule? Well, I guess in terms of the way that it uh, has an impact on individual health care decisions, uh, I'd refer you to uh, Health and Human Services uh, uh, for answering that question. Um, but look, the, the idea behind this specific rule is to uh, prevent discrimination against a against a wide range of groups. And one other area, um, there are these reports about immigration raids that are supposedly happening during May and June. You've heard even um, Secretary Clinton and um, Senator Sanders comment on this. There's the, the um, belief that the administration is going to conduct huge raids during May and June, uh, rounding up significant numbers of <coughs> women and children, uh, recent, recent people across the country, um, in, in significant numbers. Is that true? Is there something different happening now? Well, this is, um, so this is an excellent question. What, we're talking about um, a DHS enforcement action. So there are some limitations about what I can say. But let me uh, help you understand exactly the policy that DHS is implementing. Um, and I, I think I can largely answer your question. Uh, the first is, and this is something that Secretary Johnson himself has said, uh, that the operations that are underway are merely the continuation of operations that were announced in January and in March. And those operations are conducted under the rubric of the guidance that President Obama and Secretary Johnson put in place in November of 2014. Uh, and that is guidance that made a priority of individuals who are convicted criminals or otherwise a threat to public safety, or individuals who were apprehended after crossing the border after January 1st of 2014. So we've made clear that our priorities are people who pose a threat to the community, people who are convicted criminals, or people who have only recently crossed the border. So that those priorities remain in place, and those uh, priorities are followed even as these operations continue. Let me say two more things. Uh, the first is, no one is removed if they have an ongoing pending claim or appeal for asylum or some other form of humanitarian relief. People are given access to due process. Uh, and that is a, a foundational principle for all of this. Uh, so the only people who are the targets of these operations are people who are subject to an order by an immigration court for removal. And people who have also, in addition to being subject to that order, have exhausted uh, any potential claims that they have for humanitarian relief. The last thing is DHS enforcement agents also follow uh, what I understand is to be uh, long-standing guidance that ensures that these operations are not conducted in sensitive places. These operations are not conducted in schools or hospitals or places of worship, for example. So, so is there no reason to fear that the numbers of deportations are going to increase or spike, whatever, you, whatever words you want to use now, because there is something some, a, a specific operation underway that's different from what's normally happening there along the border? Well, uh, again, what Secretary Johnson has described uh, is that the operations that are underway now are a continuation of operations that were previously announced. But look, I, I think we would anticipate that the deportation numbers would continue to go up. This administration is serious about enforcing the law. And I recognize that our political opponents don't like to acknowledge that fact. Uh, but we've made clear how we're going to use law enforcement resources to enhance our border security and to enhance the security of communities across the country. Most importantly, we're going to enforce our laws. And this is something that President Obama is committed to. And the truth is, we would have a whole lot more resources to do exactly that if Republicans in the House of Representatives had not blocked comprehensive immigration reform legislation that did include an historic investment in our border security. But we do not enjoy the benefits of that border security today because 
House Republicans blocked the, com the, the passage of that legislation. Just lastly, it's not your political opponents or well, who are uh, some of the people who are objecting to this or raising concerns about this are Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders, who I wouldn't think you consider political opponents. <laughs> no, but it's our political opponents who suggest that President Obama is not interested in enforcing the law. And I think that is demonstrably false. That's the point that I'm making. That's the reason that we're having this conversation right now. Okay. Um, Anita? Oh, Leslie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She was here yesterday. She was. Yeah. It's nice to see you, Leslie. That's right. That's fine. Thanks. I had a couple questions on the um, gender guidelines you sent out last night. Um, given that North Carolina's House Bill 2, which is sort of part of this, yep. is headed to the courts, why did the White House feel the need to put out this directive at this point? Well, this is a directive that is responsive to requests that we've received all across the country from school administrators and teachers and parents and others. So this is not a response to uh, the ongoing legal dispute related, related to HB2. This is a response to requests that the Department of Education has received from uh, uh, teachers and administrators all across the country. You cautioned before about the being careful of not putting your finger on the scale. Doesn't this sort of suggest that you're putting the White House's well, finger on the scale? Well, uh, we've been quite clear about the need to keep enforcement actions uh, separate from any sort of political interference. This is not an enforcement action. This is a policy decision that was made by the Department of Education. And yes, the White House was appropriately involved in coordinating that policy decision. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of the Department of Education to make this policy decision uh, and to communicate it to the schools and uh, administrators all across the country. Notably, it's not an enforcement action. It does not add a requirement to the applicable law. Uh, and it doesn't pose any requirements on students for the use of uh, shared facilities. Uh, one of the other questions I had for you, you mentioned um, you were asked about the lieutenant governor's comments on it, and you said that he, um, it runs the risk, or it underscores the risk of electing a right-wing radio host. Um, to stay white office. Yeah, to stay yeah. white office. Yeah. How <laughs> yes, much of the, um, given, that, given that the White House, you know, last year when the Supreme Court ruled on same-sex marriage, the White House put the lights out on the, that, um, fountain. How much of this was a political consideration in, in doing these guidelines? Uh, well, I, I think as I, I as I pointed out before, the guidelines contain practical advice and suggestions for school administrators across the country that have to deal with this challenge inside their communities. They don't have the luxury of relying on political arguments that are uh, an attempt to try to score some political points that propose to address a solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist. These are school administrators who are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to promote an atmosphere of dignity and security for the students in their schools. And so what the Department of Education has put forward are practical suggestions for how exactly they can do that consistent with civil rights law. And the White House is not looking to score any political points on it, even though it's been hailed by a number of, you know, organizations as a new frontier in same-sex law? Well, I'm not surprised to hear that there are people who agree that we shouldn't discriminate against um, people because of who they are. I think there are, I think most Americans agree with that notion. So that, that's part of why I anticipate that uh, school administrators across the country will welcome this guidance. Look, I'll also say, I think school administrators across the country who don't agree with the politics of this administration will also welcome these suggestions because they recognize that they have a challenge that they have to deal with and that, frankly, they don't have the luxury of engaging in a partisan political argument with a right-wing radio host. In fact, what they have to do is they have to provide for the safety and dignity of the students who are under their care. And that's exactly what this guidance does is it gives them some, some useful tools for considering a range of options that they can use to do exactly that. So this, this has very little to do with politics, except for our critics who want to make this entirely about politics. This administration is interested in providing workable, practical solutions to school administrators who are trying to provide for the safety and dignity of the students under their care. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Josh. Mark. Josh, is it the intention of the administration that the guidance letter be seen as a threat to uh, deny federal funds to school districts that don't comply with the, uh, the policy decisions as interpreted by DOE and DOJ? No, they should not view it that way. They should view this as guidance, as specific suggestions 
and a framework for dealing with a very straightforward challenge. How do school administrators all across the country ensure that they're protecting both the safety and dignity of every single student at the school? It's as simple as that. And what the Department of Education has done is they've drawn on their own internal expertise and they've drawn on the creative solutions that have implement, been implemented by school administrators all across the country to put all that good information in one place and provide some practical advice to school administrators who are trying to solve this problem. And that's a, that's a good thing. I think what is, what is true, what is undeniably true, is the foundation of this guidance is the principle that people shouldn't be discriminated against just because of who they are. And school administrators don't have a glamorous job. These are individuals who I think in most cases feel quite passionate about their work. They view their work as a calling. They're looking to prepare the next generation of Americans to succeed. And they want to create a learning environment where every student can feel safe, where every student can feel included, where every student can feel respected. That's what the vast majority of school administrators are interested in, and that's why I think the vast majority of school administrators are going to use this guidance they're going to carefully consider the suggestions that have been put forward by the Department of Education, and they're going to put forward a solution that works in their community. Uh, that's, that's, the way this, that's the way this should work. Could you see how some might um, see the guidance letter as an implied threat of loss of federal funds, being that you mentioned that under the, you know, under the provisions of Title IX, schools that receive federal funds are obligated to comply with the uh, the provisions uh, that yeah. are stated forth in the guidance letter. Look, there is a there is a desire in the, in the guidance to be as clear as possible about why this guidance is being issued. But look, our it's quite clear what we're interested in here. The 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 Department of Education is interested in providing guidance and suggestions to school administrators who are trying to do the right thing. And that right thing is to prevent people from being discriminated against, but also make sure that every single student in their school uh, has their safety and their dignity protected. On another issue, do you have any further guidance on the WASPs legislation? Uh, I do not. Um, this is the, this is the, this is the bill about the, yes, the, the World War II uh, women Air okay. Force veterans, pilots. Um, I, I do not believe that we have received that from, uh, from Congress yet. I don't know if we've got an updated, an update on that. but. Uh, we'll, we'll be tracking that, and um, we'll keep you posted on the uh, status. Do you know but the president possible? does intend to sign it. Right. And okay. you said that yesterday. Okay. Do you know why the president could not have, as commander-in-chief, directed the Army to allow a burial for these uh, women uh, at Arlington without legislation? Yeah. I don't know exactly how the, how the law works. I don't know uh, if his authority as commander-in-chief could have been used for that purpose, but we certainly welcomed uh, the bipartisan legislation from Congress that would make the use of that or the exercise of that authority unnecessary because, uh, you know, because Congress has, uh, uh, has passed a law making it possible. Thanks. Okay. Chris. Thanks. Everyone's in my business today. Um, I'm sorry? Everyone's in my business today. I, I know, man. <laughs> you got to help all these people out. <laughs> um, yesterday you said that uh, there was a determination that the, um, as, a, as a result of multi-agency review that there would be no loss of federal funds uh, at this time to North Carolina as a result of House Bill 2. But at the same time, the, this guidance uh, on uh, transgender uh, students is, is issued. Isn't that something a mixed message? Well, uh, uh, no, I don't think it's a, it's a mixed message. I think it's just a, it's important for people to understand what's, what's happening here. This, this guidance that was put forward by the Department of Education does not impose any new requirements under the applicable law. It's guidance that's issued to school administrators and school districts all across the country. Uh, the conversation that we've been having over the course of this week has largely been centered on the state of North Carolina uh, and what impact their law could have on um, their compliance with uh, the Civil Rights Act. So it was related to a specific piece of legislation that was passed almost literally uh, in the dark of night by the legislature that convened a one-day special session to pass this bill. It was signed the same day by the governor. Uh, and the rebuke from business leaders in North Carolina and business leaders who are contemplating doing business in North Carolina 
has been forceful. And I think it's an indication that the legislation that was passed by the state legislature was much more, was much broader uh, than just uh, something that would apply in an educational setting. So, you know, the situations are, 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 are quite different. I think they do illustrate how consistent and forceful this administration has been about fighting against the idea that people could be discriminated against because of who they are. Uh, that's, a, that's a principle the President does feel strongly about. Uh, it's obviously a principle that uh, Attorney General Lynch spoke movingly about. And um, preventing discrimination and treating people fairly is a core principle that does guide a lot of the policy that's made uh, by the Obama administration. Uh, but you know, the enforcement action that was uh, announced by uh, the Attorney General this week uh, was an enforcement action that was the decision uh, of attorneys at the Department of Justice. Uh, that, that decision was not influenced by uh, White House officials. Uh, the uh, notification that was distributed by the Department of Education today is not an enforcement action. Uh, it was a policy decision that did include some White House involvement, but was uh, the realm and responsibility of the Department of Education. Well, nonetheless, given that the major component of House Bill 2 is that transgender students in North Carolina are prohibited from using the restroom system with a gender identity, and then you, doesn't that necessarily mean that even if schools choose not to follow this guidance the Department of Education pulls, uh, has put out, that, you will, that they will not suffer a loss of federal funds? Well, what this says is, well, the way this works is that if there are schools, and I think they will be in the minority, but if there are schools across the country that do come forward uh, and indicate that they do not intend to be in compliance with this guidance, then there is an established process uh, for litigating those differences uh, with the Department of Education. Um, so there's there's established process for this. We don't have to invent one. And okay. Was it a uh, plan to make the announcement that there would be no loss of federal funds for North Carolina at this time? Uh, in conjunction with the announcement from uh, the Department of Education and Justice for this guidance for, uh, for, for transfer students, or is that coincidental? Uh, no, these, are, these were separate actions. So again, as it relates to North Carolina in consideration of, of HB2, uh, the policy decision that was made, uh, even as agencies were considering whether or not um, the passage and implementation of HB2 would put a range of federally funded programs at risk in the state of North Carolina. Uh, the decision that was made was to not withhold any funding until the de enforcement action that was announced by the Department of Justice had made its way through the courts. Um, so that's a, that was a very specific thing, and that was a response to um, you know, developments that occurred this week uh, with regard to uh, the situation in North Carolina. This guidance is guidance that has been in the work, works for years. Uh, and, uh, but it is guidance that is um, uh, broadly consistent with the kinds of principles uh, that this president and this administration has long fought for. One last question. Um, even after you said yesterday, it, with regard to HB2, that there uh, would be no loss of uh, federal funds to the state as the enforcement action is ongoing in the courts. A Department of Education spokesperson said the review there is ongoing. Do you know why the spokesperson would have said that? Um, I don't, but this is a little complicated, so it may just have been a, a, a bit of a miscommunication. Uh, but as it relates to specifically to HB2, uh, no federal agencies will be making a decision to withhold funding as a result of HB2 until the DOJ enforcement process has worked its way through the courts. Okay. Margaret. Of guidance like this, or do you foresee similar um, <coughs> directives to come from the administration? Well, I, I'm not aware of any other. Um, I mean, I guess it's sort of when you say like this, you mean guidance that could have an impact on. Well, you said that you had received inquiries <coughs> from the educational community, if that's you're responding to it. Have you received inquiries from other industries, companies elsewhere, also demanding this kind of clarity on how they should be treating transgender people? Uh, that, that, that's, it's certainly possible. I'm not aware of any, um, uh, of any uh, guidance that's likely to attract the amount of interest that this one has. Um, I'm going to go back to an, an idea you were talking about here with, with Kathleen. Okay. Can you just 
clarify, does the president see this as a clear-cut civil rights issue? Well, I think um, there obviously is a question of civil rights here, and there is a question of how can we ensure that the civil rights of every student is protected? There's also a question of how do we ensure that the dignity and safety of every student is protected? And the guidance that we have put forward would do both. And again, I think that's why we're going to see uh, a lot of school administrators come forward and announce their intent uh, to implement this guidance. Uh, or they're just going to implement the guidance without, without announcing it. Or, like many school administrators, they're already doing this kind of work to ensure the safety and dignity of every student at the school. Here, this is the, and this is the thing that I was mentioning, mentioning before. This is, some, this is something that over the last week or two has been a pretty loud part of the political debate. But this is something that school administrators all across the country have been dealing with for quite some time. Uh, so they don't have the luxury of falling back on talking points. They've got to implement practical real world solutions that make a difference when it comes to the safety and dignity of students at their school. Posting a law enforcement officer outside of every bathroom to check the birth certificate of people who are walking through the door, that's not a practical solution. That's not going to enhance anybody's safety. It's not going to enhance anybody's dignity. It's impractical. It's rooted in a, in a political argument that has very little grounding in actual facts. So I recognize that that is sort of something that politicians frequently do, uh, which is make arguments that may sound good politically just to score some political points. But to do that at the expense uh, of students all across the country is um, something I don't think that they should do. But when you say the question of civil rights, but, I mean, are you parsing here that it's not a civil rights issue? I mean, is this because the courts still haven't ruled on whether um, there is protection under the law of transgender persons as a protected class as an extension of sex discrimination? Prohibition? Well, well I, I think what is, what's undeniable is that this is an issue where there, uh, you know, where case law is still being built up. Uh, but look, I, I think the, the reading of, uh, um, of this guidance, I think, is, is pretty common sense. You can't discriminate against people because of their gender identity. You can't force people with a specific gender identity to use a different facility. That's, uh, that's discriminating against them. What we should do is we should treat every student the same. We should protect every student's safety. We should protect every student's dignity. We should give every student access to individual use facilities if that's what they prefer and they're available. That's, um, that's, that's, the, that's the cornerstone here of, of our argument. You're saying the case law is still being built up, but you're not going so far as to say that, that this is on shaky legal grounds because we still haven't seen federal protection. No, no, there, this, uh, I, I don't. I don't mean to telegraph. Uh, what I don't mean to telegraph any lack of confidence in the legal conclusion that's been reached here. The law is clear, uh, and um, it's. I think it should be notable that it's not just the Department of Education that signed on to this, but the Department of Justice is too. Uh, my w w the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, Margaret, is that this is, look, this is something that is relatively new. And this is a relatively new policy consideration that school administrators are, are having to make. And this is a relatively new element of our uh, political debate. Uh, there was a, uh, I, I was thinking about Chris earlier today because there was some discussion about whether or not the word transgender had ever been uttered from the White House podium before. And I think that's a pretty apt illustration of how this debate uh, is changing and has emerged. So it's new to our political debate, but this is not new when you consider what school administrators have had to do to ensure the safety and security of every student at their school. This is something that they have to deal with every day. And that's why most of them don't have a lot of tolerance for a bunch of cheap political rhetoric. They're looking for solutions. And solutions are exactly what were provided by the Department of Education in their letter today. OK. Rich. Hey, Josh. Um, you say that this is a, a problem that school administrators are dealing with. But then it was also a problem that 
that didn't exist until it entered this political realm. How long has the administration been getting questions about this? And uh, did the North Carolina law prompt this guidance or speed its timeline? It did not. This is, a, this is guidance that had been in the works for years. Uh, this is relatively new to our political debate, but again, this is something that um, uh, that has been the source of uh, of questions that the Department of Education has received for uh, for a number of years now. Um, and again, I, those questions to the Department of Education were not rooted in the desire of a high school principal to make a political argument. It was rooted in the desire of a high school principal to get some advice and to rely on the experts at the Department of Education to help him or her ensure the safety and dignity of every single student at their school. That's what these principals are looking for. Look, in most cases, principals aren't making a whole lot of money. It's not a glamorous job, but they do it because they care deeply about our children. They care deeply about providing a good quality education to our kids. They care deeply about the future of this country. They care deeply about ensuring that a learning environment that they are responsible for managing is one that's respectful, that's inclusive, and that is safe. And that's the kind of uh, guidance that they were seeking from the Department of Education about how best to accomplish those goals. Does the administration think, though, or acknowledge at least, that there still is a, a very difficult process here? For example, um, the guidance says that when a student or the student's parent or guardian as appropriate notifies the administration, the student will assert a gender identity that differs from their previous representations. The school will begin treating that student consistent with the gender identity. Mm -hmm. And then goes on to say the gender transition can happen swiftly or over a long duration of time. If a principal is sitting in front of a student and there could be questions of clarity, sincerity. I mean, these are all things that are still not answered and out there. Right? Well, I, I think this goes to, to Ron's question. We acknowledge, and in fact, this is what should happen. School administrators do have to make decisions about the best way to protect the dignity and safety of the students at their school. And yes, these are complicated issues. And that's setting aside even the kinds of arrangements that might be available to a school administrator. And some, so many of our schools are so wildly underfunded, right? So the, you, you face this question about, are we going to build a new bathroom? or we're going to provide up-to-date textbooks in our science classrooms. That these are practical questions that uh, administrators are going to have to answer for themselves. That's why it would not be wise for the federal government to be imposing a solution or adding an additional requirement under the law. That's, in fact, why we have not done that, because we believe in the value and the importance of local control of schools. So we want schools and we want school administrators to be reaching the kinds of conclusions and the kinds of solutions that are in the best interest of that community and that are in the best interest of the students who attend that school. So that's also why you've seen the U U.S. Department of Education draw upon solutions that have been implemented by schools all across the country and surfacing those good ideas and sharing them with other school administrators that are trying to solve the same problem. That's a, that's a, a pretty high-functioning U.S. Department of Education providing a valuable service to school administrators all across the country that are simply just trying to provide a safe and inclusive learning environment for their kids. In the past week, the administration has um, come out very strongly on, on these issues with the action against North Carolina, with its guidance today, and those are uh, domestic issues. Internationally, the United States still has relationships with and gives aids to countries that uh, puts LGBT, LGBT P, T people behind bars, mm -hmm. uh, charges them, and uh, executes them. And is the U.S. going to exert its influence internationally on this? Mm -hmm. Well, Rich, I would tell you that we do. The President strongly advocates for the rights of all people when he travels around the world. And we certainly have made a direct statements. Well, let me say it this way. The President has been crystal clear both in public settings, but also in private settings, in his conversations with world leaders about our expectation and the priority that we place in this country on human rights. Do we threaten funding? Well, we, I think that that has been a question that has been uh, discussed in a number of other settings about whether or not significant human rights violations 
undermine the relationship that the United States has with other countries, or in some cases could even interrupt funding that is provided by the United States to other countries. There was a, uh, an amusing situation uh, a couple of years ago where there were questions about whether or not the United States was going to uh, interrupt the federal aid that we provide to Egypt in the aftermath of a crackdown on political dissidents there. Now, that situation is not funny, but it did provoke uh, uh, an amusing response here as I tried to describe the way that uh, funding is provided to individual countries in tranches. Uh, and so some people had some fun with that. But it underscores that this is a policy priority of the president when he travels around the world. I've sat in rooms where the president is talking to world leaders, and the, the president of the United States respectfully but directly raises concerns about the treatment of minorities in their countries, including uh, the rights of um, gays, lesb gays and lesbians, uh, and the rights of uh, political dissidents, uh, the rights of women, the rights of journalists. And look, the president, as a country, these are values that we are deeply invested in. And we use our influence around the world to try to advance those values. Uh, and the president makes that case rather forcefully, uh, both in public and in private, on American soil and when he's abroad. And quickly on the guidance, yep. um, do you expect lawsuits? Well, I, again, I, what I expect is that the vast majority of school administrators are going to take a look at this guidance and figure out a way to implement it in their schools. Can Kenneth. Um, Josh, thank you. To follow up to the follow up to the follow up on the question of transgender guidance. Okay. Um, I'm summoning a lot of patience today. <laughs> Does the administration in its final months expect to issue any more guidance on uh, topics, issues this, that the education department is dealing with? Um, for instance, uh, there's a hearing that happened this morning where a uh, mother said that football you know, killed her, slowly killed her son because of concussions. So I'm curious, are there any other directives or issues or guidance that the administration plans to give out that impacts the nation's children, like guidance on CTE? Well, I, I don't have any uh, announcements about additional Department of Education guidance that's likely to be issued in the months ahead. You can certainly check with the Department of Education to see if they can give you a, a, a preview of uh, what other uh, policies they may have uh, uh, in store. Um, on Zika, back to that for a second mm -hmm. here. You mentioned yesterday a list of things that the Republican-led Congress has not done, such as Zika, uh, Puerto Rico, opioid addiction. Well, the House passed... Passing a budget. Passing a budget. Yeah. The, the, the House passed stuff 18 bills um, on opioid addi addiction yeah. uh, yesterday. And on Zika, I know you mentioned that the funding is not enough that on the current legislation that's being making its way through right now. Um, does the President expect to pass these pieces of legislation if they get reach his desk? And are you championing the uh, bipartisan effort by the Florida Senators Rubio and Nelson to give fully funded $1.9 billion? Yeah. Well, we certainly welcome the bipartisan support that our Zika proposal has received, uh, including from um, Senator Rubio. Um, I think this reflects the degree to which, for all of our policy differences with Senator Rubio, when it comes to looking out for the public health and well-being of the American people, there shouldn't be a partisan difference. And I think Senator Rubio and Senator Nelson both understand uh, the consequences for mothers and babies in Florida of not doing everything possible to fight Zika. So we certainly welcome that show of bipartisan support from Senator Rubio and Senator Nelson and, um, and hope that the United States Senate and the United States House will listen to the advice of our public health experts. The $1.9 billion number was not chosen at random. It actually reflects the sum total of efforts that our public health professionals say they can and should take over the long term to protect the American people from Zika. So if there are some public health professionals in the United States Congress that have looked at this carefully enough to offer up their own alternative, they can do that. But 1.9 billion is what our public health professionals say that we need. 1.9 billion is what our, uh, what our bipartisan governors from all across the country uh, believe that uh, Congress should provide so that they can fight Zika in their communities. So uh, there's strong bipartisan support for our proposal because it's rooted in the facts. 
because it's rooted based on the advice of uh, the top scientists in the country. Uh, that's why we welcome the support of Republican senators like Senator Rubio. That's why we welcome the support of Democratic and Republican governors. And we would welcome bipartisan congressional passage of uh, some legislation that's long overdue. But will the president sign anything less than the 1.9? Well, there's, this is a, a process that, unfortunately, is still working its way uh, through the United States Congress. Uh, we would have liked to have seen Congress begin this effort many months ago. Uh, the President convened a meeting with his national security team and his public health experts in January to discuss this issue. Just a couple of weeks later, he signaled his intent to request resources from Congress. Just a couple of weeks after that, we put forward a specific proposal that detailed how that $1.9 billion would be spent. So. We worked at a very rapid pace over the winter to put forward this request. Three months now have gone by, almost three months, and we've seen very little movement uh, from Congress, and that's been quite disappointing. Uh, but maybe as people like Senator Rubio weigh in and demonstrate uh, bipartisan support for this recommendation from our public health professionals, maybe we'll uh, build up some momentum here. Okay. Suzanne. Josh, on another issue, on the day that the President is hosting several world leaders of uh, the refugee crisis, it was back in September that he pledged he wanted to allow 10,000 Syrian refugees into the country um, by the end of fiscal 2016, October. So you have some time, but uh, the latest State Department statistics showing just a little bit more than 2,000. Is the administration confident that you'll reach your goal of 10,000 uh, by October? And can you also explain some of the, uh, the, the delays and, and the slower than expected uh, process that they've gone through? What, what's, what's been some of the issues? Well, Suzanne, the, the, the challenge here is simply this, that individuals who enter the United States through the refugee program are subjected to more screening, more background checks than any other individual who tries to enter the United States. Uh, these individuals have to undergo a background check. They're interviewed in person. Biometric data about them is collected. And then all that information is then run through databases that are maintained by the United States military, U.S. intelligence agencies, uh, other national security organizations in the United States, but also law enforcement organizations in the United States and law enforcement organizations uh, overseas. So all of that work takes time. Uh, and the President was clear that we're not going to cut corners when it comes to security, even as we meet this ambitious goal. So I don't think anybody was under the expectation that there would be a linear increase in the number of refugees that would be admitted to the United States. I think we always contemplated that this is a program that would ramp up over time as we, as we added capacity and as we added our capacity to conduct these background checks. So there's no denying that there's a lot of work to do to meet this goal. Uh, it is an ambitious goal, and it will be challenging to get it done. But last year around this time, there were questions raised about whether or not we would meet our previous refugee goal because we'd fallen behind pace. Uh, but yet, based on uh, the good work of our uh, professionals at the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security, we did succeed in meeting that goal last year. Uh, and the President's made clear that meeting the more ambitious goal this year is a top priority. And uh, I'm confident that all the people who are working on this problem uh, understand the priority that the President has placed on this issue. And how has the political rhetoric kind of said about the harsh language and some of the, the fear that's been drummed up around immigration and around the refugee crisis impacted the administration's ability to get them through the pipeline? Uh, I don't think it's had an impact. Uh, the people who are working on this uh, inside the U.S. government are professionals. Uh, and they understand exactly what needs to be done when it comes to uh, implementing these uh, vigorous background checks. They understand why it's important that a thorough vetting be conducted uh, before refugees are admitted to this country. Uh, and, uh, and that's what they're doing. And uh, the political noise has not uh, impacted their ability to do their jobs. And just to be clear, the administration is confident it'll be able to reach its goal, 10,000? Uh, I am confident that the people who are operating this program understand that the President of the United States thinks this is a top priority, and they have some work to do to meet this challenging goal. Um, so uh, we certainly intend to reach this goal. Okay. Janet. Hi, Josh. Thank you. Going back to immigration, um, many of the critics, immigration critics, have called for refugee status for the Central American families. Will there be any action on that? And 
Will you, um, would you say that this is in correlation to the spike of Central American families crossing the border that have been apprehended at the border in the last few months? Uh, no, it's not. As, as, um, as Secretary Johnson has indicated, the operations that are underway are a continuation of operations that were previously announced. Um, at the same time, I do think it is important for people who are in Central America and contemplating making the dangerous journey through Mexico to try to get to the United States. These operations should make clear that that's not an option. That's not a viable option. It should also make clear to parents in particular that child smugglers who say they can sneak their kids into the United States are not telling the truth. And in fact, entrusting your children to those smugglers is dangerous. And we strongly encourage people not to do it. So that's an important thing. It's important for people to understand what the policy is in the United States. It's also important for people to understand what we've tried to do. And what we have tried to do is to enhance the assistance that the United States provides to countries like Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, last year in the omnibus budget proposal, about $700 million was provided by Congress to uh, improve the security situation in some of those countries or make contributions to try to improve the security situation there uh, and try to address some of the root causes that would prompt people to undertake this dangerous journey. So uh, if this serves to discourage people from considering to make this journey, that would be a good thing. But our motivation for carrying out these operations is rooted in President Obama and Secretary Johnson's commitment to enforcing the law. Uh, we're going to do that in a way that is humane. We're going to make sure that people have access to due process. The only people who would be subject to operations like this are people who are subject to an order of removal by an immigration court. Uh, the only people who could be part of an operation like this and removed from the country would be people who have exhausted any sort of claims for asylum or hum humanitarian relief. So uh, there are rules that govern this. Uh, but at the end of the day, the president's serious about enforcing the law. The president does continue to believe that there's a better way uh, and that comprehensive immigration reform legislation through Congress uh, would uh, uh, improve uh, the way that we manage our immigration system in this country. And there is no viable way for a refugee status for the Central American families? Well, there has been a discussion uh, about working with the United Nations to allow people in Central America to apply for uh, asylum uh, and be considered, be carefully vetted. Uh, for uh, inclusion in some sort of refugee process. Uh, and we have worked diligently with the United Nations to try to get that process up and running. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do uh, with regard to establishing that program. Uh, but there has been some consideration that's been given to that idea. What's notable about that is that is an application process that doesn't begin in the United States. It actually begins in Central America. Uh, and again, that should serve as a, an encouragement for people to who are interested and think that they may apply or may be eligible for that kind of humanitarian relief, that they can apply for it in their home country. They don't have to undertake the dangerous journey to try to get to the United States. They don't have to trust uh, a smuggler. Uh, they can apply for that status in their home country. Okay. Gardner. Um, Josh, as you know, um, data out today show pretty sharp increases in murder rates in the last few months in about 20 different cities. Is that a reason for concern? And do you have any more to say on Comey's interpretation of that data? Uh, I don't have anything to say beyond what I said yesterday. Uh, I will say that when Director Comey was talking about this, he acknowledged that there's a lot of ambiguity about the broader trends. Because in some parts of the country, uh, we haven't seen an increase in violent crime. And overall, uh, crime across the country is at or near historic lows. The example that he raised that I think is uh, an illustrative one is that we have seen uh, a spike in violent crime in Dallas, but not in Houston. And so the question is what, what accounts for uh, that differing environment? And um, so we've got uh, experts at the Department of Justice who are taking a look at these situations. What President Obama did last year was actually direct his attorney general to ramp up the assistance that we can provide to local law enforcement that is trying to fight these violent crime spikes in, in some communities uh, in the country. 
And that additional assistance has taken a variety of forms. Uh, it has included um, widespread sting operations that were carried out by U.S. Marshals uh, to round up individuals who were wanted for uh, violent crimes. Uh, there's also additional assistance that's been provided to uh, individual law enforcement organizations to improve training uh, of their uh, law enforcement officers to make them more effective. So uh, there is some assistance that the federal government can provide to law enforcement agencies that are dealing with uh, these kinds of spikes. Uh, but it is unclear uh, what's contributing to those spikes because we do know that as a general matter all across the country, uh, crime rates remain at, uh, at or near historic lows. You dismissed the notion, his notion, that there's some sort of Ferguson effect. And I think you talked about how there's no evidence to back that up. I guess what I'm trying to understand is, do you think that he is wrong, or do you think that he just doesn't have the evidence to substantiate what he says? There's just sort of a difference. Either you're not sure, or you're sure he's wrong. Yeah. Do, can you help me untangle that? Uh, I think the point that I was making yesterday is, and this is based on a conversation I had with the president, This administration makes policy decisions that are rooted in evidence, that are rooted in science. We can't make broad, sweeping policy decisions or draw policy conclusions based on anecdotal evidence. That's irresponsible and ultimately <laughs> counterproductive. The President actually has a lot of confidence in the vast majority of law enforcement officers all across the country to do their jobs and to do them well and to do them selflessly and to do them in a way that is effective in fighting crime and protecting civil rights at the same time. The President does not believe, at least he's not seen evidence to substantiate the suggestion, that there are a significant number of police officers out there who are unwilling to do their job because they fear being filmed by somebody's cell phone. But look, if there is evidence that materializes to substantiate that claim, then we should figure out something to do about it. So I guess the point is, there isn't evidence out there to draw any firm conclusions uh, about what's happening. The President does have a lot of confidence in the vast majority of law enforcement officers that are selflessly protecting our communities and doing it in the right way. But we should look at this problem and get to the bottom of what exactly uh, is going on. And Director Comey did indicate that it's unclear what's going on. He acknowledged that it's a complicated situation. That's where he used the Dallas-Houston comparison to illustrate that, the, that there is no clear answer to what's going on here. And what Director Comey said is, we need to spend more time trying to figure out what's happening. And he's right about that. And we should use the evidence that is uncovered to formulate an appropriate policy response. And that's, a, uh, that's what the President believes the, uh, the priority should be. Josh, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about everything. You guys are swimming in uncertainty. We, we all are. I mean, we, we, one has to act in the face of uncertainty anyway. Yeah. Uh, you're suggesting, it seems to me, that you, you're not acting because you don't have evidence, when in fact, in nearly every case, you have to act in the face of uncertainty anyway. Or, yeah. uh, can you help me sort of again yeah. well, untangle look, that? Uh, well, I, I think what I would say is we do often, the President often talks about this, about how often uncertainty uh, impacts the decisions that he's required to make as the President of the United States. That uncertainly, uncertainty typically applies to situations in which there are no guarantees that what the President is prepared to choose will work. So for example, if we determine that the so-called Ferguson effect is potentially contributing to an increase in crime, then we need to sit down and figure out what can we do to address it. And there will be some uncertainty about whether or not that will work. But there won't be uncertainty about the fact that we're trying to solve the right problem that we're trying to solve a problem that actually exists. And so collecting evidence to verify what it is possible to know, um, even if, once we get to the stage of considering solutions, that there will naturally be some uncertainty about 
what the future holds. But even in that case, there will be some evidence to inform the choices that the president has to make. Well, you've got more dead bodies. I mean, that's clearly a problem. Whether no, 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 I'm not denying that there's a problem as it relates to the the spike in uh, in violent crime in some communities across the country. That's why the president last year ordered the the attorney general to. Um, uh, provide some additional assistance to law enforcement agencies. We saw uh, the Marshal Service carry out a, 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 a widespread sweep that resulted in about 8,000 fugitives being um, uh, being captured. So uh, I, I'm not, I, there's plenty of evidence to indicate uh, that there are some communities. Again, this is not a widespread phenomenon, at least as, as based on what we know now. But there is evidence to indicate that there are some communities, including the president's hometown of Chicago, are experiencing uh, a troubling surge in violent crime. And the president has ordered action, specific actions, to try to address it. But there's not evidence at this point to link that surge in violent crime to the so-called uh, viral video effect or the Ferguson effect. Uh, there's just no evidence to substantiate that. And there's some anecdotal evidence to indicate that that may be having some Im impact. But there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that the vast majority of law enforcement officers, men and women across the country, are doing their job as well as ever, that they're fighting crime, that they're protecting people's civil rights, that they're acting selflessly and bravely to communicate the, or, or to protect the communities that they are sworn to serve and protect. So that's the, that's the ambiguity that uh, exists, and that's what we need to get to the bottom of before we start offering up specific uh, solutions. On the transgender question, can you help us untangle the president's role himself? Like, did he play a direct role in the guidance? Did he meet with his attorney general in the last week or recently to discuss this? Did he meet with his education secretary in the last week or the week before to discuss this? Did he encourage the issue in himself of this guidance? And what in particular might have persuaded him that this was the right thing to do? So can you, we're just looking yeah. for a little bit more about what yeah. President Obama himself, what role he played right. in this? Uh, what I can tell you about the president is that he was regularly updated uh, as this policy process moved forward. So he was certainly aware of the policy that was uh, under deliberation by the Department of Education. And I can tell you that the outcome does reflect his view. that the Department of Education should be responsive to requests that they've received from school administrators, and that the Department of Education has an obligation to put forward tangible, real-world suggestions for how this problem can be addressed in communities all across the country. The President also agrees that uh, imposing an additional requirement under the existing law is not something that the Department of Education needs to be doing right now. So it's possible, and in fact important, for the U.S. Department of Education to play an appropriate role in offering this guidance to school administrators that are trying to enhance the s safety and protect the dignity of every student in their community. That suggestion is that he's sort of a bystander to this guidance coming out, that it was part of a process, that it came out of the departments, that he didn't really do much to encourage or discourage, it just sort of happened. Is that uh, an appropriate interpretation, or did he play a more active role? In it? Well, obviously the president sets a, a longer-term vision for the priorities that his administration is going to pursue. Uh, I, I can't speak to all of the conversations that uh, President Obama has had with uh, the ed education secretary about this or other matters, but um, I think it is fair to say and I think it's important that this kind of uh, uh, announcement reflects the president's strongly held view about the need to uh, prevent discrimination, but also the need to protect the safety and dignity of every student in America. Uh, so this does reflect the president's view. And, um, but at the same time, there's a, an established policy process for considering these kinds of questions and ensuring that the outcome reflects the priorities that were set by the President of the United States. In this case, they were. In, in an interview with the Rutgers student newspaper, President Obama defended his administration's crackdown on leaks and press freedom by saying the prosecutions 
or a small sampling. But the truth is the administration has targeted more whistleblowers and prosecuted more leak investigations, including of my colleagues, than all previous administrations combined. Can you explain the president's remarks? Does he, you think he's aware of just how many more leak investigations this administration has conducted versus uh, all of his predecessors? Well, I don't think we're going to get deep into this today, but what I will say, let me say a couple of things about this. The, the first is what the president said is true, is that a number of those uh, investigations were initiated by the previous administration. Uh, what is also true is questions of criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions are not influenced by the president or any other political operatives in the White House. These are decisions that are made by Department of Justice prosecutors. That's the way the process should work. And it would be inappropriate for the president to intervene in either way. It would be inappropriate for the president of the United States to intervene with the federal prosecutor and say, you should go investigate this individual. It would be just as inappropriate for the president to intervene and say, you should lay off that guy from the New York Times. That would be inappropriate too. We've got a Department of Justice that is insulated from politics for a very good reason. Uh, and you should uh, check with them for insight into the prosecutorial decisions that uh, attorneys at the Department of Justice were making. But do you think he's regretful then that these prosecutions took place during his administration? I mean, he then went on to sort of talk about how his notion himself is that there should be as much freedom as possible. As you say, these prosecutions took place during his administration, and your suggestion is that it took place essentially without any input from him or any of his direct reports in the White House. And I'm suggesting it would be a genuine scandal if that were not the case. I think that's right. So okay. is, he, is he sorry that, that this number of prosecutions took place during his administration, given the fact that he can do nothing about it? No, I, I, I think the, the president does believe that people who swore an oath to protect sensitive information should follow it. And the president does believe that the Department of Justice uh, and other agencies have a role in enforcing that oath. And that enforcement should take place uh, without regard to pol political considerations. Uh, and there's just such an inquiry that's going on right now that I'm not going to comment on, but I think it is an indication that this is something at least when it comes to the handling of these kinds of matters by the Department of Justice that should be firmly insulated from politics and therefore uh, insulated from influence by the President of the United States. Do you know of any previous state dinner that celebrated five countries at once, Josh, by the way? Uh, I don't. That'll make uh, tonight's uh, event all the more special. Okay. All right. Jonathan, I'll give you the last one, then we'll do the week ahead. Uh, th thank you. Uh, the President's going to the Rutgers on uh, Sunday. Uh, why did he decide to go to Rutgers? Were any loud voices urging him to go? And can you give us an advance uh, preview of what he's going to say there? Well, for years, uh, students and other leaders at Rutgers have been encouraging President Obama to consider delivering the commencement address uh, this year because it's the 250th uh, anniversary of the first commencement address or the first commencement ceremonies that were hosted at Rutgers. So the President's looking forward to participating in this historic occasion. Uh, it certainly is the mark of a remarkable institution of higher learning. I know that Rutgers in particular is quite proud of the class of 2016, and the President is looking forward to uh, congratulating that class on all that they have achieved. Uh, I think you'll have some observations about the world, the world that they're prepared to enter. Uh, this is a, they're prepared to enter a, a, a country and a planet that's rapidly changing. And the, these students uh, are as well prepared as any students have ever been to confront those challenges and use those, this changing environment to create a better world. And um, that's what makes the President so fundamentally optimistic about the future of our country. Uh, and that optimism is manifested quite well 
uh, in this year's uh, graduating class at Rutgers. Okay. So with that, why don't I do a, a week ahead? Will you visit the um, I don't have any notes about any unplanned, unscheduled movements for the president, but uh, we'll see if he was able to make the most of his visit to Rutgers. Um, so on Sunday, it's, this is not written down here, but obviously on Sunday the president will travel to New Jersey and deliver the commencement address at the 250th uh, commencement at Rutgers University. Uh, on Monday, the president will host a Medal of, Medal of Valor ceremony at the White House. The Medal of Valor is awarded to public safety officers who have exhibited exceptional courage regardless of personal safety, in the attempt to save or protect others from harm. On Tuesday, the President will attend meetings here at the White House. On Wednesday, the President will participate in a DNC roundtable. On Thursday, the President will award the National Medals of Science and uh, Technology and Innovation um, to 17 scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and innovators. The Medal of Science recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to science, engineering, and mathematics. The Medal of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation recognizes those who have made lasting contributions to America's competitiveness and quality of life and helped the nation's technological workforce. Uh, on Friday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. And then on Saturday, the President will depart Washington, D.C. en route uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, this trip will highlight the President's ongoing commitment to the U.S. rebalance to Asia and the Pacific, designed to increase U.S. diplomatic, economic, and security engagement with the country and peoples of the region. Uh, so this is obviously next Saturday, a week from tomorrow, and uh, we'll have uh, a lot more to say about the President's trip to the Asia Pacific uh, uh, during next week's briefings. So with all of that, uh, I hope you guys all have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.